Welcome back to part two of our interview with Ryan Orwig, the founder of StatMed. In the first part of this episode, Ryan went over the StatMed workshop versus the course, went over test taking misses versus knowledge misses, pattern recognition for board's material, and how to have a study plan and troubleshoot that study plan to see where you're making mistakes. In this episode, we're going to get back to the memory devices that we usually cover in the Medical Anemonist, and that includes mind maps and memory palaces and other visual markers. So it's a really informative interview, and there are a lot of great examples here if you can follow along. StatMed Learning has also been kind enough to give you, our listeners, a special promo code to use their StatMed class and StatMed Boards Workshop. Use the promo code TMMP2019 for the Medical Nemesis Podcast 2019 and receive a limited time discount this summer. You can use this by going to statmedlearning.com or the statprogram.com. The information will also be available in the show notes. Again, this is a cell phone quality audio from the guest side, but you can still hear pretty well, and there will be a lot to learn from this material. So I hope you enjoy this episode. Welcome to the Medical Metamus Podcast, your source for memory techniques and accelerated learning in higher education. Now, here's your host, Chase DeMarco. And then we get into like some integrated notes, which again, integrated notes, anything you make that, that, that allows for retrieval practice. Should, should, everything should be built for retrieval practice. And then, you know, the time management stuff, I don't even like talking about time management. I think it sounds super generic. I think a lot of it's taught in a punishing manner, in a very reductive manner. I only talk about time management once we change study methodology. And then everything that I do with, with that is it should facilitate the space, for, uh, you know, space repetition. It should offload management. And, and it should be the kind of stuff you read about with entrepreneurs. I think med students have to look at themselves as entrepreneurs. Like your, your business is being a med student. And nothing's more like in the writing and the literature is about like entrepreneurs and time management, maximizing the time. And a lot of that, I think, has to be adapted for med students and, and doctors who are stuck. I definitely agree. Uh, actually finishing up this book right now, and I'm adding a lot of business concepts for time management into medical study skills. I think it's going to be uh, an, yeah. an interesting combination of a lot of the material that we usually don't hear combined. They should be. They absolutely should be. That's where the most interesting writing is. That's where the most interesting thought pieces are. And it's the most actionable stuff. Mm -hmm. Like if you read about anybody, any entrepreneur, I mean, they're just banging their head against the wall with productivity. That's my every day for every every day for me. Like I'll never know what it's like to be a med student. Now I, I do apparently have powers of empathy and pattern recognition. Like I've heard, you know, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of stories of people struggling. And I think I've aggregated and internalized. So I understand those patterns. And I feel for these people, and I'm impressed by them as well. But what I do understand is the time management crunch and that productivity crunch, where I feel like I've got 40 hours of stuff to do in, in, in a day, and I've got to manage it. I've got to be effective. I've got to be efficient. I've got to figure out what's urgent and not urgent, all that jazz. But yeah, that's sort of where we come from with our two platforms. That's, again, that was supposed to be short, but talking about the, the board's workshop and, 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 and the, and the StatMed uh, class. Okay. So... What I'd like to transition into a little bit more now is some actionable steps that students and the audience can take right now, such as any advice you might have specifically for a retrieval practice or memory palaces, mind mapping, anything like that that you'd like to cover that they can implement now or practice with now, study with now. Well, the first thing I would jump on is mind mapping. Now, depending on what we mean by mind mapping, I, I, but if it's mind mapping with words and details written out, I hate mind maps. I, I, I will never teach them. And now, look, if it works for some med student, if you're sitting there and you're a med student, like, I love mind maps. They help me get great, great, take great, <laughs> awesome. But I'm never going to teach it to somebody because I think if it works for somebody, it works. But and let me tell you why. And this is a tip, I guess, right? A mind map is basically recopying all of the details. Like, it has structure and details, and you're writing it all down. Once you, and you're just, it's, it's blind copying. You're just doing all of this laborious work to recopy stuff, which you can likely do largely on autopilot. This idea that I'm rewriting it or retyping it is giving me value. It's not. Or if it is, it's just not, it, it's not best practice. And so and I've had people come to me for years and years, like, oh, I'm supposed to be doing these mind maps. People feel guilty because they're not working. 
they feel guilty because they're or, or they're feeling frustrated because they're doing all this this heavy lifting to write, rewrite, recopy all this information into this configuration, and it doesn't work. The vol and, and maybe it does work better at a low level. I don't know. It's not the best. I would never recommend it for anybody. But if it, it works at a lower level, it, it, the sheer volume and scope of, med of medicine, of med school, of boards, trying to mine that best stuff is 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 a, is a waste of time. Now, if you wanted to write out the structure without the details, which sounds counterintuitive, then maybe you're on something. This is what we, this is how I would do it. I would take like that hierarchical structure. So let's say I'm doing like a lecture on chromosome abnormalities. Now remember, I know nothing about medicine, but I'm just, this is just stuff we teach, concept, all right, structure examples. And I've got a lecture on chromosome abnormalities, chapter on chromosome abnormalities. You don't just, the structure isn't just the, the, the five main categories. It's like all the way down to the details within the framework of it. Okay, I've got an under aneuploidy, you've got Down syndrome, Prater Willy, whatever the other one is, right? And then, like, what, then if they're wanting to know, like, what's the occurrence, what's the recurrence or recurrence risk, what are the signs and symptoms, what, what are like treatment options, those are subcategories. And then you should be using that to self test and check back against the source. People are like, yeah, but I don't want to go back to the source. I, I, that's like, sorry, that's the easiest way to do it. And now if you read it and mark it in a way that facilitates it, but it, this is, we need a package that's going to facilitate retrieval practice. And I, and I think the missing component in most of the literature is, I mean, I, you know, retrieve, we know retrieval practice and, and, and space repetition are the, are the two key strategies. We know this, and the, the literature is so cold on this. We know that effort is really important. But it's the type of effort that we need to unlock. I rarely meet a med student who's struggling who's not putting in Herculean effort. But it's like trying to swim straight at a riptide. You know, you can use, you can put all your effort into that riptide swimming straight at it, when all you need to do is turn 90 degrees and swim lateral to get out of it. So we have to figure out, we want to give packages and tools that are going to help them unlock that effort. So instead of putting in the effort of writing out the mind map, which is brutal. I would rather direct the effort toward attempting recall at the, the hierarchical information going from the subcategorization back to the details. And yes, it's going to feel terrible because you're failing. I just studied this. I only remember 10%. This is terrible. That is the name of the game. Retrieval practice followed by what we call the self-check. You have to check the source. If you do the retrieval practice and don't self-check it, then it's a waste of your time. You self-check it you are getting a blind improvement. We don't get a ticker printout that tells us, oh, you just improved your retention by 30%. But that's what we are getting. We're solidifying the memory. We're offsetting that curve of forgetting. We're stabilizing the memory. We're, we're building better retrieval pathways. And it's a blind improvement, which is hard, which is, which is hard for us to accept. But that's going to lead to better long-term retention. I talked about the three pieces leading to effort. The fourth piece, which I think is not emphasized enough in the literature, is organization and structure. I think that, and that's that, that single track versus a dual track. If you're a dual tracker, structure is, is found organically. But if you are not a dual tracker, if you're a single tracker, we need a skill to offset that. And that's where writing out the structure, deep structure, can have profound payoff if you retrieval, do engage in retrieval practice off of it. So that's where I think you want to go with this. And again, I'm, I'm not a test guy. There are ways that we can teach this. It just takes two or three days. Everything we do, we teach with contextualized examples, step-by-step uh, -step illustrations of how it's supposed to work, trial, error, all that jazz. So that's that's just a piece on mind maps. We can talk about memory palaces too. I mean, that's interested in, right? Yes, um, So memory palaces are one of the skills that we've been teaching for, you know, 15 years. I read like Scott Hagwood's book way back when on it. He was one of these early memory camping guys. One of my students facilitated an opportunity back in 2005, 2006. We went and met him, did like a seminar with him, went out with him, had dinner and drinks and all that stuff. He's a really interesting guy. But he was just the first person that gave me some insight on how this whole memory champion stuff, this is before like Moonwalking with Einstein and all that stuff came out, and gave me some insight into it. But you know, I had to build this up from scratch. I'm very interested in memory palaces as a very explicit, scoped and sequenced process. So much of memory palacing can happen in, in, in the head, in, in, internally. And that's a problem for me as an instructor because I can't see what's working and what's not. So <laughs> what we do 
is we have a very rigid, explicit, almost like it could be, it's not punishing, but it's like accountability. You have to write it all out in a step. So it's like our, our memory palace process is a nine step process. So it starts with identifying content. So what do I want to learn? Like, let's say I'm going to do like Graves' disease. So I've got the topic of Graves' disease. And so I, I, number one, I have to figure out, you know, well, what's my topic? And then I want, and, and part of that is numerating it. How many pieces of information do I have? The numbering has to be explicit, including the title. So let's say I've got eight, seven bullet points in the title. I've got eight things I need to know. So then I choose a real world space, RWS, real world space. What room am I going to use or pathway? So then you do this. So a lot of this is very much like it's just step by step, right? And the idea is if you teach it like this, then they can become more organic and fluid with it. That's what I was going to say is probably the benefit of that because a lot of med students used to certain procedural type organizations don't really have that for memory palaces. So developing that initially just as a starting launching off point and then becoming more organic later on. Sounds like yeah, a, a yeah, very good way to approach and we, it. We, and we emphasize this, but, but, but guess what med students also want to do? They also want to jump ahead. They don't want to do the elementary foundational building. I mean, so speaking from my experience with, thousands of people doing this. They want to jump ahead. They want to cut corners and then be like, yeah, 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 I got that. Like, but do you? And our job is to say, I don't believe you. I mean, you know, with a bit of a smile, but also with a bit of an edge. Like, like I don't, I, I, how do I know? Like, write it the way we want you to write. So anyway, so, you know, we have them. I need the content. Okay, I've got my grades of these eight items total. Determine the real world space. I'm going to use like this bedroom from Ritter Boulevard. Then you determine the RWI, real world items, low guy. So then we have them go around like on a whiteboard, bird's eye view. What items are we going to use? Maybe you populate the room with 10 things and you pick the, 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 ten, the eight best ones. So we need eight. Then we create a table. This is, this is a breakthrough seven or eight years ago. We make this so it's like, like a Word document or Excel document where it's, it's you're going to write all the stuff out. And again, I don't care what they do later. As long as it's based, you can't tell, report it. I can't plug into somebody's head and see what they're thinking. So they, in the table, they're going to go in there and they're going to, you know, they're going to list the, 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 like the, the content. They're going to list the real world items are lined up, you know, uh, the, the, so, you know, engraves the ex Falmos has to go with the TV. You know, it's, it's going to be very meticulously lined up. Like the bedside table has positive thyroid activating immunoglobulins, whatever. Like that has to go with that. And then we have them strip out the key sounds. So how many key sounds do I need for these links? So they strip out this key sounds. That's the fifth step. And so, you know, exophthalmos doesn't really have a key sound. I'm not going to have an X that I, I can read. Oh, it's like a giant bulging eye. I can use bulging eyes. But some things might need, like graves, you guys even want one thing, a grave. That's fine, right? But some things are going to need multiple sounds. Multiple and like pre-tibial mix edema. I'm going to go with pre and mix. That's two things. That's a, I'm always going for what we call the MEL, the minimum effective length. These are all terms that we teach and illustrate in, in ex- exhausting detail. Um, <laughs> okay. But as well, it should be, right? So you have your key sounds, and then you have to generate link ideas. Now, look, you're coming up with the link, not in relation to the real-world item. That, that paints people into a corner. So if I've got like pre-tibial mix edema, I've got pre-mix, okay, pre, what can I use pre? I'll, I'll use like pre-fontaine. I'll use like the Billy Crudup, Billy Crudup version of the runner from the movie uh, without limits. Um, mix mixers, like, like mixer heads on a, a blender thing, right? Okay, so those are my two links. I haven't done anything with them yet. Right now, this is very clerical, a little creative with the links. Then, after we generate link, you know, we, we determine our links, then uh, you generate link ideas and you determine which one's two steps. Then link eight, we, we do what we call build our scene. And the scene is when we see the real world item, and then the weird thing happens with the link and that connects the two together. We want our link to usually, not always, usually be nouns, to be things, concrete. We don't necessarily want them to be actions. We definitely don't want them to be adjectives. Then again, can you do this? Yeah, of course. You can do adjectives. You can do verbs. But when we're trying to lay out best foundational processes, it's better to lay it out like this. And then they write the link 
starting with zero, the real world, I, I mean, it's real reductive. You I see the TV, and then I turn the TV on. I said, you can be involved because you're neutral. And then you, what you don't see is like, I see the, a cartoon with somebody's eyes blowing out. That's too realistic. We don't like that. We wanted to break the rules of reality, but we wanted to cost Hollywood special effects. I turn the TV on, and these giant eyeballs like brrr, stretch out at me. Done. Because we only need that one thing. So we, we like emotion. We like altering the real world item. We wanted to have to cost Hollywood special effects. If it could happen in the real world, it's probably not good. And we want it written in that formula. I see this, the real world item, and this happens. We don't want to see it as a snapshot. We don't want to see it. We, and, and, and so some people, so we make people write it really meticulously. Zero, one, zero, and then one, and then two. So like chlamydia pneumonia, we're, we're using a table, okay? And I've got, I've got clam new. So I want like a clam, like a cartoony clam and Nemo for pneumonia. So I don't want to say like, I see Nemo and a clam at the table. That's like all one blob. That's all one, that's a picture I just described. Mm -hmm. I, I, I want to see, oh, I look at the table. And then I want the first thing, the clam, come in and eat the table. And then Nemo comes and opens it up. And it's like you're awkward, like, Nemo, like the clam's aggressive, Nemo's embarrassed or whatever. Yeah, you like really you have add those dynamic scenes to, to get the order for one, but also just make it more memorable. Yes, absolutely. Yeah, but and so and, and so one of the struggles that we see we've seen over the years, and we're fixing it. We fixed it with this numerated sequence. Numerated sequence is you make them write it meticulously with the numbered sequence, and then and then we can see the code and the, the the matrix, and we can see if there's a break in the code. If someone, if you don't have these rules, and somebody writes it like I see Nemo and the clan at the table, and the table's written last. Well, are you seeing it all happen at once? Because the real world item, the table is the hook. That's the that's the thing that everything has to be hooked on. Are you seeing the table first? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm seeing the table first. Maybe, <laughs> maybe not. That's why we're really meticulous and demanding about how these things are written. And then the, the final step is we have you have to do retrieval practice. You have to attempt recall. And you just write it down on a dry erase board. And all you're doing, you're not writing Nemo and a clam and a table. You're just writing, oh, I see, you're just writing chlamydia pneumonia. That's all you're writing. But you're going through it in sequence. And our rule is four times in 48 hours. And then you have to self-check the the, the, the the artifact you created while making this thing is the record for posterity, for, for references. So now you've built this thing as, as a byproduct of creating it. And it's also the record against which you self check. Mm -hmm. If you don't have that, it's all it's all for nothing. Yeah, so many, short term. Exactly. So many times I've either made static images, and then when they're static, you can't necessarily remember what order things go in, or would forget it a week later, a month later, and didn't have a written version to self check. So now that visual aid that I made that I like so much is gone forever because I had nothing to yeah. back it up with. So writing oh, it you, down. You have really yeah, you have to have a record of it, and this is actually, and again, like there's a learning curve to this. This is going to slow someone down profoundly at first, but once you get, and it's a steep learning curve, but once you get over that learning curve, I mean, I, I've had people hate the skill and be like, I'm not going to use this, but it's like, well, you still have to learn it right now. And then they get into med school, say, so say a second year, they, they take the class between first and second year. I don't like that. That's, that's too weird for me. Okay, well, practice it anyway. That's what you're here for. Then she gets into med school. She gets super sick in her farm unit, and she only has like has like a flu, like real sick. Three week block for farm has only a week to do it, and so back against the wall, she memory palaces the heck out of all of the ugly, bad memory palaces, but using process, and she gets like an eighty sum on her exam, which she probably would have only got you know in her old way, maybe not even that. So nice. it's a really profound it's a really profound process. But I mean, you know this. I mean, you've been wrestling with this. It's hard. Definitely. And so we had to, what's that? And even going from one subject to the next can be hard because you have to make a whole new visual library for pharmacology versus micro versus pathology and just the different terminology, the different names of everything. It gets very complex sometimes. Oh, for sure. And we, I mean, part of this, like we do the visual mapping and we're teaching people to build what we call SBL, sound-based links, 
ABL, association based links, and PLs, prescribed links, and BLs, basic links. So you've got these, you're, we're already teaching people to make, and I mentioned the MEL, minimum effective link, minimum effective link. So we're teaching people, because you don't want to do all hieroglyphical, like syllable, every syllable, like that's too much. And again, we, we are very capable of learning terms and concepts, and that's why the retrieval practice is so important. You can take something that's fuzzy and, and, and not great and built structurally right, and you can then really learn through the retrieval practice, the self-test and the self-check, the terminology. Like if I'm like using my laundry room to learn about sickle cell uh, disease, and then like at the table, at the, the, the utility sink, I want to learn aplastic crises. I, I don't know what this is. I mean, do I need the sound A, plas, Christ? Do I need all three of those? I go minimum effectively. I just want plastic. So I imagine I turn the sink on and then it starts bubbling up with those plastic solo cups. And you imagine them bubbling up and falling over and clattering. Like so the red solo cups from like, you know, college or whatever. Yes. Like clattering all over the floor. I don't know what that sounds like, but I can imagine. And so that gives me plastic. And that's not a great one. I, I, in reality, I would use plastic man because I my, my knowledge of those things goes you know, too deep. Um, and I try not to broadcast that onto the students. I'm mean, happy to talk about, you know, DC Comics, Marvel Comics, if that's what they want, but that's not for everybody. So I try to use some examples that are a little more, you know, uh, uh, across the board. But again, I don't need a, I don't, I don't need like an apple popping up for A, plaz, and my friend Chris showing up. Like I could, yeah. but I want, it, I want it to be lean. And then after four self-tests, I'm going to learn that term A, plaz, and crisis. The problem is not A, plaz, and crisis. The problem is, does A plus crises go with sickle cell or something else? That's where the problem comes in for retrieval for, for, for the students. And so if you tag it in that room, then, you, you know, it's, it's there and you learn the concept. So that's, that's sort of the process. Not, I mean, again, I don't know if any of that is, is, is different than what you've been practicing or some of the stuff you've talked about. Does any of that strike you as interesting or different out there outside the box? I find it all interesting because everyone has different variations. So in... Uh, let me give a couple examples of making one for a word. If you're trying to learn a language, you want to remember every syllable. So you need multiple visuals right. for that one word. You basically take every syllable or every sound. But I agree when you're thinking of terminology, such as in medical class, you don't necessarily want to do that. And no. the one that's coming to mind from a sketchy video was ceftriaxone is an antibiotic and it's a three headed ax, I believe it was. So something like that to make it simple, one if at all possible, mm -hmm. one visual, but yeah, minimum mm -hmm. required visuals is going to help you place it somewhere and not get it mixed up with something else, as long as it's not a similar sounding word. Yeah. But then I well, guess... And whenever, you have, whenever you have a similar sounding word of drugs, for example, that's where you're going to need multiple syllables. But again, you can go into the multiple syllables, but you're asking what's the least amount of multiple syllables that mm -hmm. I need. And that's how we sort of play with it okay. from there. So I, I, and just I don't know, an example of a classic mistake that we would see, right? Building a memory palace, having an issue with a flawed link. So let's say we want to learn about different types of headaches. That's very simple, I know, migraine. Let's say we're trying to put my, attach migraine to, we're, we're using our, our college dorm room, and we're going to attach migraine to a bed. We've got a bed there, okay? So the classic mistake that somebody would make, is they'll, they'll, they'll look at the bed and they're thinking about migraine. How can I connect migraine to a bed? See, this is, this is lacking structure. And they'll be like, oh, well, when I get a headache, I go lay down in my bed. And they visualize themselves laying in their bed. That's a terrible thing. That's, ter that's a terrible scene. Because it fails what's called the second direction. Uh, yeah, you can come up with anything in the first direction. The first direction is coming up with the, the, the link that's going to connect to the real world item. But the, the second direction is, can I see that? Like a video playing in my head. I see the bed. I see myself lay down. Does, on second direction, does that come, can you pull that back to migraine? No. It's boring. It's realistic. Generic. And it's also like a million, a million different, I, I, I lay down for a million reasons. Like, that's not going to link back. Mm -hmm. So, and, and, and I think the fatal flaw here was they were coming up with their link while looking at the real world item. I think when you do that, it, it paints you into a corner. And again, once you get good at it, can you do it? Sure. But as far as on the developmental curve of, on skill acquisition, I really, I, I don't want people to do it. I don't want, you can get away, again, you get away with it, fine. But we don't want to let bad habits contaminate skill acquisition. So let's think about that my, migraine sound, what's it sound like? So I like, the, if I, I don't like rhyming. I don't like back-end rhymes, I like front-end sounds. 
So I go my my migrates. Now migrates a verb, but I think if I, if we had like two or three images for migrate, let's think what an image for migrate means. Birds. So the, the, the flying bee, the flying bee mm-hmm. bird. If I showed any of like a bunch of us a flying bee birds, what's happening here? Within two guesses, we're going to say migrate. So you know, so I look at the. I imagine. Okay, so I've got enough connect flying V to the bed. How's that going to work? So to me, I, I look at the bed. I, it like turns into like the sky, like those wizards or witches looking in the water to see what their enemies are. I don't know what that reference is. And then, you know, they're seeing the clouds and then the flying V of birds fly across. Done. Done. And it's not, you're not, you're not adding witches. It's you. You know, you're there. You're, not, you're never adding other people or, or things like that. And then you have it. So that's a better version. And you would write it like, you know, I look at the the bed, the zero bed. I look at the bed. It start, always starts off normal. It has to start off normal. And then the bed morphs into the sky with the birds flying across. And yes, we're adding sky, a little dodgy. But again, you're as we illustrate, we show where we're, you know, skirting up against the rules and whatnot, and, and you go with it. Then one, one last, does that make sense, uh, Chase? Does that yeah. Good? I just feel like people that watch more cartoons are going to probably be much more natural at this type of creativity and uh, absolutely. Well, be- but the good news is we're all we've, we're all just immersed up to our eyeballs in cartoons and CGI. It, it makes it so much easier now than it would have in the if you're growing up in the '80s or you know the '50s or something like that. But we're all so immersed in. I mean, just a commercial, you know, with anthropomorphism with Disney, with commercials, with cartoons, it's everywhere. I mean, just, you know, it, it's, it's probably harder for somebody who grew up in a different culture who is not steeped in this stuff. When I deal with, like, some of my physicians who are like, yeah, I, really, you know, I read a lot of books, and, like, they're, like, in their, they my age or older, like, it's, it's a harder skill, I think. It's a harder skill to, to acquire. But for the most part, we're very steeped in this stuff. Yeah, the more... You know, the more of the pop culture, the, 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 the like fantasy cartoons, any of that stuff, it all, it all helps. But that being said, I've taken some literal minded people who had who would describe themselves as not having a creative bone in their body, and they had they run wild with this stuff. And it's about it is about tapping into stuff you know. So if you don't know about a bunch of pop culture junk that you know about politics and history, you can totally use that stuff. It's harder if you don't know what the historical figures look like. I don't know how you use some of those people. If you don't, I, I can't do that. But fortunately, again, like if I needed John Adams, I don't know what John Adams looks like, but I've, I've seen the HBO series. I can have Paul Giamatti or whoever played him. You know, I can visualize that. I, I check that or I want to watch a movie trailer. And then I, always, I would have those visuals. And then one last one. So let's say we want to learn H influenza and we want to attach H influenza. We're using the bathroom in our grandmother's house. We want to attach it to the toilet. Okay, so we got bathrooms, real world space, the toilets, the real world item. I want to attach H influenza to that. First, I got to figure out what are my key sounds? How many sounds do I need for H influenza? Well, I think I need the H hem sound and the influ, influ, whatever sound. So I need two links minimum for this. And this person chooses ham for H, ham, ham, the hemopolis, whatever, that's good. But you got to know what the ham looks like. Are we talking about like deli ham? It can't, because it can't be just, it can't be linguistic. It has to be visual, you know? So is it like a cartoony ham, like the big old slice on the bone? That's how I would do it. I've never seen that in real life. But yeah, big Thanksgiving it. ham kind of deal. Yeah, like a clip art type <laughs> thing, you know? I don't know. Okay. But why do I know that? That's, that's an association I have, right? But I wouldn't use a pig. Some people would say I'm going to use a pig. It's just, it's just an extra step. Yes, I could get to... If I had to, I would use a pig, but a pig is not ham. I mean, yeah, if I picture a pig, pig, I'm going to think of the word pig, not the word ham. Yeah. So you're right. kind of backing yourself into a corner. Yes. Now, again, if I have to, I can make it work. But if I do that, with, see, again, with best practice, we don't want to allow for that kind of stuff up front. You want to really try to be precise when you can be precise. And then when you have to go farther afield, then you can do it, you know? So they're going to use, and then influenza is actually a really hard when you come up with something that's like the influ just doesn't, doesn't sound like a concrete thing. Yeah, maybe so like the, use, the flu shot. <laughs> maybe, yeah, yeah. That's, 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 not bad. That's, such a, that's such an iconic thing. It's so relevant yeah. now. It's just, but it, as long as you know it's a flu shot, not shot. Because flu is a descriptor mm. of the shot. Again, I've, I, it's not that I've, I've done this. I'm not naturally good at this stuff. This wordplay. This is something I've had to get good at because of it. So a flute. A flute gives me that flute, flute sound. It's very direct. It's a concrete thing. It's weird. So here's the back. Here's so this is all good. What they built is good. 
the scene they build is bad. They build a scene. I see, and this is what they say. I see a ham and flute on the toilet. Terrible. Fail. Very bad. You know? Terrible. Because they're not starting with the toilet, and it's all fused together. And, and even though it's weird, a ham and a flute sitting on a toilet, it's also boring. It's not costing effect. There's no change. There's no alteration. There's no emotion. So a better one, but still flawed, is the, I see the toilet. It overflows with a ham guy that plays the flute. So it's an anthropomorphized ham. Great. I love that. He's playing the flute. My problem with that is the flute and the ham are coming together. I prefer compartmentalization. Like I want each actor, each agent to show up on stage by themselves. Does it have to be this way? No, I don't think so, but it's better. And again, if you let, and what happens if you don't fix this for someone who's at the bottom of skill, at the initial phase of skill acquisition, they're going to be less likely to be able to utilize the skill. And that's our role. And that, so that's the educator in me, right? This is what's woven into the fabric of how we approach this stuff. And again, I, I approach it as an educator. I, and I'm an old athlete. I approach it as a, as a bit of a coach with some firm feedback. And again, it's our, it's our, not, our job is not to give you a gold star. Like, good job. You tried that. I'm not, I'm not going to do that. You know? I mean, I might try it. But at the heart, I'm going to be like, that's wrong because, because of this. And that's what you need. That's what we need in this stuff. And... Yeah, learn the foundations first, and then you can get more creative afterwards. Yes. yes. Yeah, you want to go play, if you, you want to play soccer, but you, and you don't, but you don't know how to use the proper part of your foot, hit the ball to make it go where you want to go, then you're not going to have fun at a higher level. Because, like, you were trying to kick it, like, you know, over here, and you kick it 45 degrees at different angles. Like, why did you kick it over there? And the kid's like, eh, I was trying to go down there, I couldn't. Because they were not, they did not develop proper mechanics at the baseline. And so this is about philosophy, it's about theory, but it is about mechanics. And again, we had to build a structure, a structure that works for us, that made sense to us, that showed that it worked over time, and to provide that structure to teach it. So to fix this one, again, I've got a toilet, then I've got to have my ham, and again, anthropomorphizing, giving you a characteristic is great, and I've got a flute. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I've got to see the toilet, I've got to have the ham do something, and then I've got to have a foot do something. You can, mix, you can mix and match. You can be doing something. It can be doing something. The action, the cause, effect, if you can tie it back in to the toilet and have it affect the toilet in some way, that's going to be better. Uh, not adding other, other actors, other, other concrete things is going to be better. So an easy way is, like, I go to the toilet. I lift the toilet up. I'm imagining that tactile feel of lifting that toilet lid. And then it's normal, but then like a, a ham, like a, well, this cartoony ham, me, comes out aggressively out of the toilet. And then I use a flute to hit it back down into the toilet. And I'm imagining like, I, I, I guess I've held a flute at some point in my life because I know how light they are. And I'm hitting it. I've never had the pleasure of taking a flute and hitting a, a, a chunk of meat with it. But I can imagine the, the, like, the squelching. And he's like, you can hit it hard, but if you hit it too hard, you're going to break the flute. So, and, and these are the little little elements. You don't write that in there, but these are the, the, the things you're visualizing and, and considering from a sensory perspective when you're building these memory palaces. So, again, I see it as a, it's very similar to the stuff I talked about with test taking in the sense that there's a very specific scope. We want to make things external and explicit. We want to create an artifact as we're making it so that we don't have to go back and make another artifact that can then serve as the record. I, I recommend like a Word document and then you type it because then you can revise it and all that stuff. And if you like handwriting, it's fine, but I think that that could get, that could cause some problems uh, down the line. So yeah, so I mean, I think that that's sort of where I come from with memory palaces. Does that, does that shine a light a little bit on our philosophy? Cool. Today? Yeah, uh, definitely. And I love the, the breakdown part because a lot of the memory champions, for instance, that I've interviewed in past episodes or other memory palace educators, they all approach it a very different way. So memory palace mm-hmm. champions or memory champions, they approach it in a, I need to remember a lot of quick facts that you have, you know, yeah. 30 seconds to remember, you know, thousand digits or whatever. So they need right. a, a different tactics and they don't need to remember remember that string of thousands of words or letters or numbers uh, a month or six months from now. So doing it specifically for medical education has becoming uh, more interesting to hear different theories about and different tactics. Cause even then you're using a different population that really their minds think a different way. They, 
want an organized process, at least to start off with. I want to follow X, Y, Z, or ABC, one, two, three, whatever you want to use. And we usually don't have that. So a lot of my experimentation in the past and reading from these memory champions, it was really hard to convert over. And it yeah. still is in a lot of topics. So it is. I really like to hear the the breakdown that you guys used. And a lot of those techniques probably wouldn't be the best once you get the foundation down. You want to switch it out for something that's maybe more obscene is often uh, something that's recommended by a lot of memory people because it's easier to Obscene, yes. Oh, sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, obscene, offensive, all that stuff. We just don't, you know, I'm not going to... Because all, yeah, all these illustrations I'm class. telling you... Yeah, all, all the... Like, I, these are all illustrated. Mm-hmm. So these are like 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 illustrations that we show. So Because, again, like, describing it's one thing, but we want to show what these things look like in crude, animatic form. And again, yeah, the obscene things, I'm not going <laughs> to... But it's true, yeah. I mean, that's what you do. It's the Von Restorpian you know, weird, unusual, offensive, crude, like, yeah, we remember that stuff better for sure. And again, these things will evolve. Like any of our students who take the class, when you talk to them a year later, it's fascinating. Because that's what I do. I follow up with people. I know people. I mean, I talked to people from 10 years ago. And it's fascinating to hear where they go. Because a lot of times when they come in, they're, they're struggling, they're lost, they're in a swirl. They, they don't have structure. And then you talk to them a year later, and it's like so amazingly gratifying because they have, they're, they're speaking with agency, they're speaking with control, and it's beautiful because they're using the vocabulary that we taught them, the skills, the name of the skills, the rationales for the skills. This is the skill I'm going to use because of this. And it's really, I mean, that's the educator's big payoff there. I talked to a, I just wrote a blog, a blog post about this. I talked to a, uh, a former student who would do the class after failing first year, and now she's getting ready to get ready for step one. And she called me because she thought she needed my help. And I just talked to her, I was like, what are you going to do? Why? What are you going to do? Why? And it was a 30-minute conversation of her telling me what she's going to do and why. And she was right about all of it. And, and it in some ways surpasses me because she's the one living with it. And, and she, you know, she's organically, you know, unlocked these things and evolved it, you know, in a way that makes more sense to her. And that, that's the beauty of working with these med students. But also, like, I'm only interested in teaching med students and doctors. And that includes, like, vets and, you know, PA and pharmacy, but whatever. But, like, I don't, I don't care about how this works. These skills work for a fifth grader. I don't care about how it works for the SAT. I don't care about how it works for language acquisition because mm-hmm. that's again part of our narrow, deep trench, and that's and that's how I think it should be. You know, that's why this is our, our my life's work working on all this stuff. And it's really it's deep and, and it's narrow, but it's a, you know very in depth from there. I love it, and that you have follow up so you can actually see what things work and what doesn't, and yeah. and you know, adapt it as needed for the specific mad, population. It, yeah. I mean, it's, it's great. It's maddening because I'm never done, but it, it leaves a much better product. I mean, you, like you, you did the board's workshop a year and a half ago. Now it's, it's, it's all new because I'm talking to people and I'm listening to them and I'm like, Oh, I know I have to fix that. And it's a whole tear down and a rebuild, but that is why this stuff is as good as it is. And that's why, I, you know, that, that's essential for expertise and mastery on our end is to continually listen to you guys and to, and to, and to hear what the concerns are. As, a, as, a, as an educator coming in from the outside, you have to listen to under, you know, part of why we're so good is that we have listened to, we understand, we, we've learned what the what curricular design of med school looks like, with the curricular demands of boards and the design of boards questions. So we have to know that and we have to know the problems that people experience, the complaint, the concern, the issue. And that's the only way to build solutions. And again, these are in-depth solutions that can plug right into those those scenarios but yeah so i don't know what else what else we got great well let's see i think we're coming to closely end here but i did have one more question especially seeing your shirt reminded me and uh i'm well, not sure if you can see that guy there yeah, yeah. <laughs> but uh your your yoda for retrieval I practice do. i did want to hear that story because i have not yet I do have an issue with, uh, so like, in, like the, of, if you were to like make this sort of pantheon of the greatest teachers from pop culture, surely Yoda from Star Wars sits atop the, uh, the pantheon, right? I mean, he's the most famous, renowned, like wisdom, the teacher and all this stuff, like luminous beings and all this great stuff. I would make the argument that Yoda is a terrible teacher, okay? And this is offensive to a lot of people. People are like, oh, how dare you? <laughs> but uh, I mean, if you look at his life accomplishments, eh, it's not so great. Like, but the Galactic Republic to ruin and all that stuff. But but anyway, when Luke 
so Luke Skywalker, you know, the, the hope of the, of the galaxy, is looking for a, a teacher. He flies his ship, you know, to uh, the swamp planet where Yoda lives, Dagobah, and he crashes his ship, his X-Wing, into the swamp, into the swamp when he lands. He meets Yoda through their, you know, how that whole storyline goes. And then, you know, Yoda is training Luke in the ways of the Force. They're running around, doing flips, lifting up rocks, tapping into the Force, and all that stuff. And then, then Luke sees his ship sink deeper into the swamp. And this leads to one of Yoda's probably number one most famous teacher statement. You know, Luke's like, I'm never going to get my ship out. And Yoda's like, looks around like, what? I mean, you know, you've been lifting up rocks with the Force. Why don't you lift up the ship with the Force? And Luke's like, oh, that's crazy. They're, not, they're so different because, you know, the x probably weighs like, you know, 30 tons. And Yoda's like, no, no different. You know, like, it's all the same. It's all in your head. And so Luke famously said, okay, I'll, I'll try. To which Yoda responds, no, do or do not. There is no try, right? And everybody's like, yeah, it's the best. It's the worst. So what's Luke do? Luke tries, and he tries to lift the ship out. He gets it, you know, maybe you know, 20% out, 30% out, and then he collapses back in, right? So what did Yoda say? Did Yoda say, okay, okay. I see what you did. Here's what's going to happen. I want you to try that 20 more times over the next hour. And I'm going to be in my hut making some stew or whatever. And you come talk to me about it. And we'll debrief and then we'll try again. Is that what happened? No, that's not what happened. What happened is that Yoda looks at him and like, and, you know, like does it for him. Moves, moves the ship over. Looks like, I can't believe it. And Yoda's like, that's why you failed. Dun, dun, dun. <laughs> uh, I mean, uh, it was terrible. It was terrible instruction. What happens then is Luke rushes off and has a terrible encounter that could have swayed the, the, the outcome of the, of, the, of, the, of the galaxy, you know? Instead, he should have stayed there and, and deliberately practiced getting, pulling the shit out of the swamp. That would have been better instruction. So, and it was, so to wrap up, to bring it back around, this retrieval practice is where the money is for learning, right? But so many med students will say, well, I could try to recall this information right now, but I don't know it as well as I would like. Therefore, like, don't try, right? I'll fail. If I attempt to recall this information, I'm going to fail and only remember 20%, and that's going to make me feel bad. So I'm not going to do it. So what I'm going to do instead is I'm going to reread it three more times. I'm going to review. I'm going to look over it. So that feels better when I'm looking at it and I recognize it. That's an, uh uh-huh, yeah, I, I, I got it phenomenon. Because you're looking at it, you're like, oh, yeah, as I see these words that are directly in front of my face, I totally recognize them, which is not what this is the whole learning process is about. But that's kind of the Yoda, just do it, that sort of like absolutist in control type thing. Like, why do it if I'm not going to do it right? Why do it if I'm going to fail? Well, no, in fact, doing and trying and failing is the best route to learn. I mean, it'd be like a kid saying, I'm not going to try to ride that bicycle because I'm not going to do it right the first time I get on it. Little kids are learning engines. We need to bring that into our lives as, as, as adult learners. So yeah, Yoda, living Yoda, terrible, you know, terrible teacher. And I know people are offended by it. However, uh, I will say this. What's that? Blasphemous. Blasphemous, sure. But Yoda in The Last Jedi does say the greatest teacher failure is, which really struck a chord with me because that is not, that is not the philosophy he seemed to have in life. When he was teaching, when he was teaching Luke, he's all. So again, maybe in the afterlife, you know, he uh, he acquired some some greater depth of learning. Learning. Best yeah, he learned a little more right. about deliberate practice and. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, so yeah, that's my take. That's my take, and I and I stand by it. Um, awesome. Yeah. <laughs> well, right. This has been a great conversation. I don't want to take up too much more of your time. What is a great way for the audience to reach you? What uh, any social media or email addresses you'd like to share? Oh uh, yeah, I mean the easiest thing to do is go to the website, the Stat Program, T H E Stat S T A T Program. We rebranded Stat Med Learning, uh, but so the, the the website is still the Stat Program dot com. You can reach me through the website, Ryan at the Stat Program dot com. We have some presence on Facebook and, and uh, Twitter, I guess, but not very good. So the best thing to do would be just to go to uh, go to the website, contact us, contacts from there. Happy to talk to anybody about anything relating that, related to medical education for them, for their students. Uh, if you're a physician, anywhere up and down the line. Awesome. Any uh, parting thoughts? I think I've, I've laid it all out on the table. 
Sounds good. We have covered a lot of material today. That's awesome. I know there's a lot of a lot of valuable stuff here. Well, then Ryan Orwig from StatMed Learning, thank you so much for coming on the show. I appreciate it, Chase. Thank you. We hope you enjoyed this episode. For links to connect to us, email us, or for previous episodes, please see the show notes. We'd also love to hear from you. So please send an email or join us on the Medical Nemesis Mastermind Facebook group. Any ideas, tips, tricks, people that you'd like to hear interviewed, we'd love to hear it. Any advice to make the show better and more enjoyable would be greatly appreciated. 